Welcome, everybody. Thank you uh, for, for coming. Anybody that's back for a second round, uh, I, I don't necessarily envy your uh, position. I, I can't even imagine somebody wanting to listen to me that, uh, that much on the same subject, but here we are. Uh, and we're going to. So a little bit of housekeeping in the chat. Uh, if you can find the chat window, I've refreshed the uh, links. So all the links that I'll talk about in this presentation are in there right now. Uh, it includes a Google Drive link to a copy of this presentation in PDF format. So if you want to copy the slide deck, it is out there and ready for download is all you have to have is that link. Uh, and then there is a fresh link to the spring primer videos that I personally uploaded after uh, one of Jen staff members, Jesse Eckrod, up, uh, uh, diced them up from the spring primer itself. So all that stuff is in a playlist and up on YouTube. And then this will be up on YouTube as well. So from the first time that I did this presentation, I've added the word who in here because I realized that it was really easy for me to just assume everybody knew uh, what we were talking or who we were about to talk about uh, on it. So uh, the, the alternate cheeky title of this is uh, Shorebirds, so you've decided to ruin your life. Uh, but the, the seriousness of it, there, there's a lot going on here with Shorebirds. We're gonna cover uh, a lot of subjects. Uh, and really just kind of roll through this. And, and my main goal for everyone is to give you as many tool sets as you possibly can uh, handle or have interest in to learn to find more shorebirds and then begin the path of identification if you're not, you know, if you don't feel strong on them and to understand some of the pitfalls. There's a lot of challenges with shorebirds. They're probably one of the hardest groups. They're maybe kind of like uh, sparrows plus difficulty. Uh, and probably, I, in my opinion, much harder than raptors uh, as well, especially even in raptors in flight uh, on it. So this is some new slide content uh, I put in. I got this off of All About Birds, and I realized I could kind of force them to give me a chart. So who we're talking about here are these long-billed birds that spend their time in the mud for the most part. Now, of course, some of them spend time in the woods, specifically American woodcock in the lower left corner down here. Some of the shorebirds in North America never find their way into Minnesota, and I've thrown an X over them for right now uh, on it. And I don't want to linger on these slides too much. We will come back to them a bit later. But for the most part, I just want you to see what we're talking about from a shorebird standpoint. We're not talking about herons and egrets. We're not talking about uh, ibis in this case. So we're not talking about those birds. We're not talking about ducks, you know, that might be dabbling ducks or diving ducks. We're literally just talking about these long-billed birds that walk through the mud along the shoreline, maybe in the shallows and everything, uh, and pick things from the surface or subsurface of the mud and water. Here we can see, you know, a whole nother page full of birds. There's one that's not going to be around here like this oyster catcher. And there's going to be some like this long-billed curlew where Minnesota's last record was in 2008. So largely speaking, you don't have to worry about, you know, birds that are have a, have a purple X over them. And we're going to narrow down and we're going to be looking at about like 37 different species plus or minus, you know, depending from Minnesota. But some of these you can see in breeding plumage are really stark and uh, dramatic. Like this ruddy turnstone is pretty easy to pick out of a crowd, you know, once you get to know his picture. It's the challenging birds like pectoral sandpiper here in the second row, you know, next to the spotted sandpiper. This guy can be a challenge along with semi-palmated sandpiper. And so later on, as we get through some of the initial how to find them and things of that sort, we'll jump into some of those more challenging identifications in there. And especially how to separate things like a greater and a lesser yellow legs, which uh, can certainly be a challenge challenge if you haven't done it before. And this is the last page of them here. Like I said, I just wanted to throw these up so that, uh, you know, everybody could see them. And if you get a copy of the slide deck off the Google Drive, you know, these will be in there so you can take a look at them. Just a nice little visual reference. A couple of them here we've never seen in Minnesota again, or are very rarely seen like this 2014, you know, purple sandpiper uh, on it. And some I've marked as rare, meaning we may not get one in a given year, and it may be in every other, every third, every fourth or fifth year uh, on a particular bird. But these are who we were talking about, is, is these little kind of horizontal dudes that are out, you know, 
picking at the dirt and mud uh, and everything. And like I said, some of them end up on drier substrate, but we'll get into that. So at a more general level, let's talk about habitat spaces. Because the interesting thing is, is it's really easy for us to just assume that you will find shorebirds where you find all the other birds. And this is the group of birds where that's just straight up not true. Uh, I can't even remember where I put it into the slide deck, but uh, there, there'll be a, a figure in here that I think will surprise you uh, when I kind of share something about shorebirds in Washington County, specifically where I'm at here in Lake Elmo uh, on it. But when we talk about habitat spaces, and I've put an arbitrary percentage, and it's basically my gut feeling of how many of the, say, 30 to 40 shorebird species I've seen in each of these types of habitat spaces. And so flooded fields comes to mind, especially, uh, you know, we got three days at 80 plus degrees and it flooded farm fields very quickly. That's where the shorebirds are going to be uh, as they're migrating in. And that's where I found them in the last few days uh, was at flooded fields, specifically one here in, uh, Washington County was Fenway Avenue and 190th Street, a farm field floods, and that's where the shorebirds showed up. Now, there haven't been very many, uh, which is good because, you know, there's they're still yet to come. Um, the last time I did this, I just mentioned drawdown water bodies, and, and somebody asked, well, what is a drawdown water body? Um, these are locations where management personnel, the natural resources personnel are specifically intentionally lowering the water level uh, to very low levels. So it goes from being a lake to being like almost nothing or mud flats. Those types of locations have a lot of great value to them. The best one that I could possibly refer anybody to and we'll, we'll take a look at it shortly uh, is down at Lake Billsby in Dakota County. Uh, because they have a lot of river runoff and the Cannon River runs right through it and it's dammed there, they do a drawdown every year. So the entire west end of the lake is effectively mud flats plus a river delta uh, on it. So those are really good locations. Uh, drought stricken ponds, lakes, marshes. So anything that has water normally at a high level that gets pulled down to a much lower level. Those are the kinds of places you want to look for shorebirds specifically. Uh, and impoundments specifically, and, and I know one of our uh, attendees, uh, I think it's Charlene is up in Grant County, the North Ottawa impoundment is probably like the king of impoundments. So any kind of a location that has impounded water means they're gonna use that water in area farm fields and it's going to have fluctuating water levels. And it's always a game of when you get really good low water levels, that's when the shorebirds show up. When they're high water levels, shorebirds have the tendency to fly right over it because they need mud. They need, you know, a really good edge to uh, a location. Uh, rice paddies as well. There's a lot of northern, very northern, northwestern portions of the state that have rice paddies, and those can be extremely good if you can get a good view of them. And then everybody's favorite, uh, water treatment plants. Uh, they're not always great, but there are situations where a sewage pond is the only good water source in an area and shorebirds will show up there and hang out on the berm and the rocks and you know pick for any food they can and they happen to be a very favorite location for spotted sandpipers uh, in fact if you're trying to county list spotted sandpiper just go to the nearest water treatment plant in the middle of summer and you'll get you know a uh, spotted sandpiper uh, for that location and then beaches you know the the the, the greatest beach in the entire state is effectively Park Point up in Duluth. And that's where shorebirds show up, especially Sanderlings and Ruddy Turnstones and Dunlin. And I've had Wimbrel up there. That's the location they just drop down because you've got a giant lake out in front of them. They don't wanna make more flight because they don't know how far that is. And they're looking for a rest. So they end up on, uh, on the beach. And we don't need to go through the rest of these. It starts to drop off a bit. And I think the important thing is this last one that I've got on the screen here, woodlands with clearings. Effectively one bird. You know, we, we've got the American woodcock. Uh, somebody mentioned in chat they had one, you know, painting. A very different, you know, shorebird compared to many of the others. So most of these shorebirds show up in actual shorebird locations. And then some of them do not. Uh, some of them are also short grass prairie birds. Uh, and we'll talk about those uh, in you know coming slides. 
So translating that a bit, and I've already mentioned some of the locations, actual physical locations, you know, places where, you know, you, you should have in your head as that's a potential place where I can find shorebirds. You'll notice something about this. None of these are parks, at least for the most part, you know, like hundred or like Lake Billsby. Yeah. That's Lake Billsby regional park or whatever is part of Dakota County, but effectively it's not the park itself. That is the habitat. It is the water, the shoreline, the drawdown and whatever. Almost all of this stuff is just like Tacoma Ave and, and Carver County is literally just some uh, farm owner's field. So it's just shoulder viewing, you know, from the road. Uh, Old Cedar Avenue is a little bit of an exception to that. You know, it's National Wildlife Refuge. But like Purgatory Creek is just an, uh, a water impoundment area, you know, behind neighborhoods that when it gets low, it gets really good for shorebirds. But when it's high, it's of no value to shorebirds. Um, Salt Lake, that's just a lake out west at the, on the border with uh, the Dakotas. And it's, it's not a park. You know, there's a couple of locations or a little bit of public uh, land and stuff uh, around it. But th that's the big kind of deal about shorebirds in general is you just don't find them at the park. So you go to the park, you get your, you know, raptors, you get flyover uh, waterfowl, you get maybe ducks and stuff on the ponds or lakes, and you get warblers in your trees, and you just get a, a very small smattering of shorebirds. And that's why a lot of people don't end up with a ton of shorebirds on their personal list is because you have to be willing to like go drive to a random location, say, I'm going for shorebirds. It's a very specific activity. Um, so all of these, you know, are findable out on ebird.org on the hotspots. You can punch that name in and stuff. Uh, but I've gone a little bit further. So one of the links that I've provided in the chat, I believe it's the second one, custom Google hotspot map. Uh, and there's this tiny URL, which is just a URL shortener uh, service. I've created a map and created a number of hotspots on the map based on these previous slides so that any individual interested could just go to Google Maps and view that map and use it, you know, or, or at least interact with it, you know, to your desire. Uh, and actually, so what I'm gonna do is, I was normally, this is uh, Lake Billsby specifically here. So what I'm gonna do is, let me see if I can pop over. Yeah, so I'm on, I'm on that map now on my browser and I'm gonna go into Lake Billsby right down here. And so these are the spots that I put in. We'll let this refresh a little bit and we can see what happens. So if I move this far enough, there is a uh, spillway and dam right here, Lake Billsby Dam. And then this is the Cannon River flowing out of it. So there's a big lake, but this is the river flowing into it. And so if we pop in a little bit tighter, I've got spots marked on here where it is Dakota County property and specifically it's Dakota County Park property. And then there's also a cemetery right here. These access points that are on this map along with this access point and then this public boat launch on the south uh, shoreline, which is in Goodhue County because the county line between Goodhue and Dakota is right here. This is the premium Metro adjacent uh, shorebird location. Uh, quite honest, there's already been a couple of reports of, you know, decent birds coming in. Somebody had an early, I believe, American golden plover come in. But what happens is they do a drawdown on this. So they open the spillway gates before the Cannon River crests so that they can handle all that water coming in. So this entire area all the way out to here gets exceedingly low. There's a couple of deep spots in here, but effectively mud flats are created all, all along the shoreline and this entire back area. Uh, into here. So all of these, like when I go down to Lake Billsby, and I do go down there quite a bit during the spring, going to all of these locations is advantageous because you get a view of, say, this back little pond here, you get a view of this area here, you get a view of this bay uh, in here. And then from this view, there are usually mud flats back in here. So this is the, the big deal about finding shorebirds is most people don't think I'm going to go out to a random lake that looks atrocious at the current moment. That's where your shorebirds are hanging out. Uh, and this just happens to be, like I said, one of the preeminent locations. So, you know, consider taking a look at this map. You can create your own maps. Uh, if you open the map in 
uh, Google My Maps, you can actually do editing and modification and create a copy of this map and put your own points on it. And uh, it's a whole nother presentation in there. Uh, but definitely something, uh, let me see if I can get back to, there we go, back to the presentation uh, on there. I additionally mentioned uh, water treatment uh, plants, so sewage ponds. I have some favorites. Uh, a lot of people have, uh, you know, it probably sounds a little strange for somebody to say I have a favorite sewage pond, but the reality is that's what it's like to be a birder sometimes when you want to see as many species as you can. Uh, and some of these are favorites because you, when you get west of the cities, you end up in farm country. And farm country is noted for running water through canals and ditches and taking away a lot of the natural you know habitat and you end up with water treatment plants being really good locations if you can get a good view these are ones that i happen to personally like to stop by again these are on the map already this is just an example uh, of albany and so i've put some notes in them just so that you can you all can get some context uh with them the albany water treatment plant which would be this one on the map just northwest of uh st cloud i believe i've just got some notes about you can drive on this back road it's viewing from outside the fence only which is the case on a lot of them but you are eye level with the ponds so you're not at a disadvantage sometimes there's a weird berm and you don't get a view and you have to like walk up a berm you can like literally just drive in on this road. It's just a standard road. Get out of your car if you have a scope, camera, whatever, and you can at least get a good view of this entire pond and sometimes, you know, get some good shorebirds. So just some examples of things. And so with these two elements on that central map, it kind of gives you a little bit to work from uh, if you have a desire to, you know, to get out of the city, so to speak, and start looking for shorebirds. Um, so the biggest thing with shorebirds based on these habitat types is every year is different and there's seasonal opportunities. There are years where North Auto impoundment, like most of the cells don't have any water in them. And then there's other years where they're so full that like diving ducks and everything are nesting there and it's a completely different story. So there's a lot of Goldilocks with some of these locations. And so what ends up being most advantageous, you know, uh, I kind of put here experienced birders and what experienced birders do. A lot of times they follow social media. They wait for county listers specifically to post something on Facebook, the Minnesota County Listers Facebook group, the Minnesota Birding Facebook group, uh, and other ones of that sort. You just wait for opportunities when somebody says, hey, they're drawing down the following lake or this is low or that's low or whatever. Keep your eyes open. It's going to be good or fresh reports come into things. Uh, and it really just comes down to paying attention to uh, those things. So I've got a couple of examples here uh, that to, to help illustrate. So the, the map that's showing here is actually tilted. Uh, it's north-south axis is left and right. So north is over to the right here. So this would normally just be rotated 90 degrees up, but I, I set this so it would fit on here better. Early 2021, uh, a, a friend of mine that lives out in this area, Garrett Wee, who was a previous field trip coordinator for the MOU, mentioned that this was the water was very low here and we got into a drought this year. And so from April through August, it was very low. I didn't get there until late in the year. And by the time I got there, the entirety of the water south of this bisecting road, this 23, County 23, all the water was gone. Like literally this was a field at this point, this entire lake just disappeared in one summer. But there, there's a, a, a a water flow drainage into this pond and this pond, and there was still water in the back half of the pond and there were mud flats over the remaining portion of it. All it took was that in August for 14 species of shorebirds to be available, including buff-breasted sandpiper. There is absolutely no county park, state park, or any situation I could have gone to to get 14 species of shorebird. It literally had to be an opportunity like this, where I was just paying attention. I was like, oh, somebody reported that. I wonder how it's going now. Uh, and sure enough, it was still in really good shape. Just from that standpoint, the drought was terrible, uh, but it ended up being a really good spot for shorebirds. Uh, another prime example, I talk about flooding. 
flooding and, you know, especially we had this massive melt off. So there's a lot of flooded space right now. And if you get big rainstorms, any of that kind of stuff like that, if you get two, three, four, five inches of rain uh, out West, there's not oftentimes a lot of place for that rain to go. And, and so looking for opportunities key. And in a, in a few minutes here, we'll talk about route building and looking in between your hot spots. So you basically route is just like pick five or six spots you're gonna go to and then look in between those spots. And that's a lot of times where I end up finding more birds. So this is a good example. A friend and I set out, we were, we, I was doing a bit of a big year last year. I wanted to get over 300 species on the year and I was short on shorebirds. So we did a route. And when we just barely got through Carver County, we're just driving outside of town. I think it was Waconia. And we're just, this is a random, this is highway five. And we looked off to here and there's a whole flooded segment of this random farm field or hay field or whatever it was. You can see a neighborhood up here and a couple of houses and stuff down here, barely out of town. We U-turned, pulled to the shoulder here, got out of the car and scoped from the shoulder and had 13 species of shorebird. And you can see American golden plover, short-billed dowager, stilt sandpiper and bared sandpiper. And it wasn't even on our list. We had no idea that this spot existed. We were on our way to a sewage pond. And, and that's literally shorebirding uh, in a nutshell is go at the right times when there's a lot of flooding or even a, a reasonable amount, and then just start driving around out west uh, effectively to find locations. This is another great example, same exact day. This might've even been where we were heading. It, it probably was our second or third location in Bird Island, very small community, but they've got a nice sewage pond because it's viewable, plus this cemetery is nice for migrants. So it's a nice little one-two combo. The interesting thing is we only got three species of shorebird at the sewage pond that day. But when we were driving into town, you can even see it on the Google map over here, this low area, you can see this kind of darker zone. So that this entire field and across the street was wet. And when we came into town, we dropped down this road quick, got out and scoped 10 species of shorebird. One of the critical elements I cannot emphasize enough when it comes to finding shorebirds, you have to look everywhere. And, and what I mean by that is you look in the middle of the water, you look at the edges of the water, and then you look in the dry spaces out further from that. When we got to this location out in like this area out here, that's closer where this auto sales place is, after 20 minutes, uh, my friend found there's a whole flock of black-bellied plover standing out in the field 75 yards away from the water. Th they were there, they dropped down for it, but they were just standing out preening in the field. They weren't actually at the water's edge or in the mud and feeding or whatever. They were just, you know, kind of hanging out. It was like they were at the party, but they were in a back room somewhere. Uh, and that is a very typical uh, situation. In fact, I tell people all the time, if you go to a sewage pond, scope the ponds, scope the berm, scope the rocks, and then turn around and look at the farm field behind you. Because you're almost always out in the countryside. So look at the farm field, if it's been freshly tilled, whatever it is, get a look out in the fields, because that's where you're going to find upland sandpiper. Now you'll probably hear them before you see them, but the reality is some of these birds kind of like to be in the area, but they're also drier substrate birds, especially will uh, upland sandpiper. So looking around where you're at, uh, that's how you end up, you know, kind of like maximizing your opportunities and your potential is to check every square inch of space that's available to you, uh, at the very least with binoculars, but sometimes scoping uh, as well. Uh, this was one that I mentioned uh, a little while ago. Very current example. Uh, three days of 80 plus degrees melted everything in sight. This is up in Forest Lake, Northern Washington County. So about five minutes from the border with Chisago. This, this field location has been known for years and they actually drain tiled it, which is absolutely terrible for shorebirding because it means it drains the field 10 times faster than it would naturally. But when you have a giant melt that can't keep up, you get about four days out of it. I've been to this location six times in four different years uh, out of 11 total years. So that tells you like, how often it's good. It isn't very often, but four times, uh, four years basically out of 11 years, it's been good. And this year was a, was a good start, uh, but it happened too quickly. So the shorebirds weren't in. But the point I'd like to make here is 
this is a random farm field. You, you pull off on the shoulder and you scope and look. And I have 14 species of shorebird there, including uh, Hudsonian godwit and American avocet. Uh, and those are the only ones of those species I've ever seen in the county. And I bird this county like it owes me money. These parks here that I go to almost literally daily, I have 208 species at Lake Elmo Regional Park and only 10 are shorebirds. I have 207 at Afton State Park and only seven are shorebirds, but I have 14 in a random farm pond. That's the literal definition of shorebirding in Minnesota is you have to go to other places. It is not gonna be at the greatest hotspot in existence with the exception of maybe the North Ottawa impoundment, which is the most unreal location. Uh, you can try and bird for uh, variety in my opinion, uh, even though the habitat is really strange because it's basically just impounded water in the middle of a farm field. Uh, so route building, I'm actually just gonna like flip over to this and just show you a map. I live in the East Metro. I would pick out four or five locations that, and so these are ones that I picked off of the map that I you know, gave to you or whatever, or I might have other locations pop up and plug them in in a series in Google Maps. There's your route. Start driving and look in the places in between. Like literally that is shorebirding. That's how you find more birds. If nobody's reporting them, it's not that hard to find them yourself. You just have to be willing to drive through farm fields on dirt roads and you'll eventually come across a low spot and that's where the birds are gonna be because their migratory path is effectively running diagonal across the state from the Southeast to the Northwest. And they're going to prefer all of these ag lands Southwest and Northwest of the Metro. Effectively, it's gonna be that corridor uh, throughout uh, that section. And then of course, Duluth uh, uh, is a little bit of an exception with the uh, park point. Uh, so when, <clears throat> what are we in? I'm checking our time here, 7.30 looking good. So I was able to dawdle uh, a little bit more on some of that stuff uh, and jump into it. So spring is, uh, you know, one of the key timings for stuff and, and getting an idea on it. So I honestly do recommend uh, taking a look at an MOU day planner uh, because they have things like this besides just your day planning stuff. Uh, it has these nice guides or, you know, crib sheets or whatever uh, for things. So it's going to tell you that the shorebirds specifically in the South, that's what this S and North, and they've got them listed up here, mid-April, which is where we're at. It's the perfect time for this stuff to start. So anything that's at about the Metro and South, uh, <clears throat> is starting right now and that goes to about mid-May but when you go north and go up to say Park Point you can go up to Park Point and get really good shorebirds into the last week of May and even sometimes the first week of June all things depending uh, but it allows you to kind of split the state up a little bit and depending on your desires to to travel around a little bit uh, you can have quite a lot of fun uh, starting in the south and then uh, moving up to the north a little bit uh, later. Um, what else do I got on here? I just want to back that up. Migration graphs. So yeah, we want to talk about uh, migration graphs a little bit because those kind of help frame things up for you. We get arrival dates and stuff on the uh, MOU day planner and the, the information and the link is in the chat uh, in there. It's just out on a website and it's uh, print on demand. So you just go out there. Once you make a purchase, they print it and it gets shipped to you uh, pretty easy. And then MOU makes a few bucks off of it, which is good for uh, uh, like a donation, basically. The MOU website, uh, between it and eBird, there's a lot of information out there to help you. Uh, I do recommend out on the MOU main webpage, it's a little bit wonky sometimes to navigate. So I've kind of highlighted here, review reported birds. This is a key section. And then anything with the word migration in it, any of those brings up some links that gives you stuff like this. Uh, and at first these are a little off-putting if you don't like graphs, I have the tendency to enjoy graphs so they don't uh, bother me too much, but you get your species name. So a stilt sandpiper, and then the red is the South, blue is the North. So again, you know, kind of the Metro ish or just North of the Metro and below is the South. But what this nicely tells us is say stilt sandpiper. We're right here in April. There just aren't any stilt sandpipers in yet. And in fact, I don't think there's been an identified one in the state yet, unless it happened today or yesterday and I missed it. By the time we hit that first week of May, there's gonna be this massive spike. 
And so you get about a two week or a week and a half window for still sandpiper and they do not mess around. Shorebirds are the most proactive nesters you will find out of anyone. They do not mess around. They come, uh, they come through into the state and those that don't nest in the state, they rest and then boom, they're gone. And then we don't see them again, but their turnover is very quick. And we'll see that in a, a couple of minutes. Shorebirds are the fastest turnover birds uh, in the entire uh, uh, group of birds from a Minnesota standpoint. Their turnover from breeding grounds and return uh, is six weeks in some cases, which is absolutely insane. Like they get done feeding their young and they're like, you're good. Okay, I'm out of here. And the adults just they just head on out and then the young are coming behind them, which is why you get these slightly longer uh, bars in the fall. So you get this little uptick in July and then you get this nice slow increase and then this uh, drop off. This is adults coming back and this is juveniles and first year birds starting to come back as well. So you get that nice extended window in the fall. You just have to deal with slightly less optimal plumage conditions when you're talking about juveniles and uh, non-breeding adults. Um, one other link that I do want to mention here, because it kind of is like everything in the kitchen uh, 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 imaginable. And that's this birding in Minnesota link. So we're just up from where we were a minute ago and the detailed occurrence information. This is an example page. You get all your species in here. It's like a customized Minnesota field guide uh, for every bird in the state. And you get these same kind of graphs, but you also get some occurrence information and you get, uh, you know, recent migration or extreme migration dates and breeding range, if that's appropriate. There's just a lot of really good information. I highly recommend getting used to it, uh, but you get that same stuff. You can see south and north listed and you can see this really sharp peak in the spring. But this is, you know, we're getting very close to the opportunity time for short build or long build dowager. They come in before short build uh, and you get this nice window of opportunity in the third to fourth week of April where things just really take off. But they also drop off quickly and then suddenly any dowager you get uh, is probably actually a short build dowager once you get past that first week of May uh, on it. So again, really talking about a lot of resources, all those resource links uh, are out there uh, in the link sheet. And then the only one that I don't technically have in there is the MOUMN website uh, uh, and just you know go into there and then find those links and stuff uh, that I've got. Uh, the only thing I wanna do here, I don't wanna spend much time on this from a summer, F, uh, summer standpoint, if you miss some shorebirds, we do have breeding shorebirds in the state. As we talked about earlier, a lot of people know about woodcocks, so I don't, you know, I need to talk too much about that. Uh, denizens of the marsh, you know, Wilson snipe, you can get those winnowing. I think somebody mentioned those pretty uh, early on as having a winnowing snipe over their head. I'm, I talked about spotted sandpiper, and then of course the loudest of them all, killdeer, uh, are you know they'll take up in a rock garden out in front of my house here in Lake Elmo. They don't really care. Uh, but some of these rarer birds over here do breed in the state. You just have to go find them. And the one thing I would recommend to individuals is to take a look at the Minnesota Breeding Bird Atlas or mnbirdatlas.org. I will pop over to that super quickly here. See if I can remember where I got my links on it. Yep. So this is the website, mnbirdatlas.org. Uh, and then you can just do a find species account. So if we just go into here and say American, uh, did I? Yep, I did. Uh, Avocet. We can find the record for American Avocet. Uh, and then we can do Minnesota breeding bird distribution. Uh, and this map ends up being a little bit small on the screen, but you can actually see that in the last breeding bird atlas, there were observable breeding birds in the state, you know, out in these western counties, uh, out there, Big Stone and uh, uh, such over there. So just some useful information. I didn't actually need to open that or whatever, but useful. And there's a really good long, you know, write-ups and stuff and, and some of the historical stuff from Roberts, you know, back in the thirties and stuff, highly recommend taking a look at some of this stuff. Cause it's kind of like a supplemental field guide uh, when you get a chance to look at some of these records and say, okay, well, can I find that bird, you know, breeding in the state? It's a really good way to get that information. Uh, on there. And you'll find interesting stuff like where on earth can I find an upland sandpiper breeding? You'll find out in the northwest portion of the state, there's a lot of good prairie uh, still up there. 
and that's your best location to find one on breeding territory. And the same is true for marbled godwit. A lot of people don't realize marbled godwit breeds in the state. Uh, and you can find them up in the northwestern portion uh, of the state, like Felton Prairie is a really good location for them. Uh, ag again, just another note, uh, we kind of talked about it, the breeding turnover. This is a, a great illustration. This is out of the uh, day planner as well. Returning birds, so fall migratory uh, dates on birds. The first returning migratory bird in the state of Minnesota uh, is lesser yellow legs. The top 20, 19 of them are shorebirds. So when I say shorebirds turn it over quickly and don't mess around, I mean it. Like 19 of the first 20 returning fall migrant birds are all shorebirds. That is how they do not mess around. They get up and we've got those really short peak windows when they come in in the spring. And then when everybody thinks it's still summertime and it's time to slack off and not bird as much or whatever, it's actually time to get back out and start shorebirding again <laughs> because they're literally starting to come through in mid June. Like we've just, there's some species like Dick Sissel haven't even really gotten through a nest yet. And now we're already talking about shorebirds returning in the Northern part of the state. It gets pretty ridiculous. Um, quick reference uh, from a, a WEN standpoint, and this might get covered at the very end as well. Salt Lake Festival is coming up. I just saw some indications that Salt Lake itself is very high, so there won't be as many shorebirds, but they'll probably check some surrounding areas and there'll be shorebirds for that. So this is a really great opportunity. It's back after a bit of a hiatus. You can find this off the Minnesota Ornithologist Union website also. There's a link right up at the top corner. Can't miss it. Salt Lake Birding Weekend has all the details on it. There's hotel information, camping information, uh, all that jazz. There's a potluck dinner on Friday night, and then Saturday is all day birding. A um, couple of things I don't need to go too deep into. The MOU newsletter does tend to have uh, calendar items on it well as well, and that'll cover... Uh, Mervac trips and other Audubon groups and things of that sort. And a lot of times there are trips down at Old Cedar Avenue. And when the water's low, that can be a good shorebirding spot. I think we're out of luck uh, this spring here because there's so much flood runoff that I suspect that Long Meadow Lake and related areas uh, around there are just going to be filled up uh, this particular year. And then uh, I think Jen uh, mentioned it. I'm keynoting this year at Hastings Earth Day Bird Festival. But what I really wanted to note is there is a day trip as part of that. So after my keynote is done, the, the, the trips will depart. And one of them that goes all day then is with Jerry Hoekstra. He's the editor of our newsletter for Minnesota Bird or yeah, Minnesota Birding Newsletter. He's doing the Lake Billsby run. So if you were really curious about Lake Billsby, this would be the one to consider uh, because you'll have an expert and he'll go to each of the spots and you'll try and identify everything you possibly can. Uh, this would be a great opportunity. All right, just checking my time. looks like we're doing real good on time. So I don't wanna to linger too long on equipment, but I do wanna talk about it because it is important uh, and it is probably more important than almost any other bird group with the exception of waterfall. You can actually see about midway down the slide, you know, I talk about shorebirds being one of the most beneficial groups for a scope. Like if you can get to 40, 50, 60, 70 X zoom, it makes life a lot easier. And the reason why that is, is because our smallest shorebird is a least sandpiper and it's the size of a song sparrow. If you've ever had a song sparrow at your feet or really sat and looked at sparrows, we all know they're small, but you end up being 10 or 15 feet from them with binoculars that are eight or 10 X. Now try and look at the same bird from a hundred yards away or two football fields or whatever, that's shorebirding uh, a lot of times. Now, sometimes you get super lucky and you get a roadside pond or something at an overpass or a, you know, a crossroads and there's a little pond and there's birds 30 feet from you or whatever, but they're very skittish. And the reality is you, you need something. You, you need a, something extra. And a scope is the thing that usually does it. Excuse me. Swarovski is the top of the line, but there's a lot of really good scope to be had from manufacturers like Vortex. They make multiple lines uh, and they're a lot more affordable. Now, 
what I might think is affordable, someone else might be like, there's no way I'm spending $1,000 on a scope. There's no way I'm spending $500 on a scope. You do get what you pay for, another unfortunate. However, I know several expert birders that have a $100 scope or $150 Bushnell scope. The reality of the matter is, this is important right here. Do not skimp on the tripod. Putting a relatively weak optic on a very weak tripod is a lesson to give yourself motion sickness. If that tripod bounces around too much and is not stable or sturdy, then it doesn't matter what optic you've got. You can have the best optics on earth and all it's gonna do is shake and shudder and any wind that's blowing is gonna shake it more and you're usually out in a farm field. So if there's 10 mile, 15 mile per hour winds, your optics are moving the entire time and you need a good quality tripod. And quite honestly, I'd spend up to $250, $300 on a tripod if I'm spending, you know, 500 to 1,000 or 2,000 or more on a scope uh, just to, you know, kind of make it happen. There's plenty of manufacturers out there, you know, shop around if you get into that space. Uh, my contact info will be on the end of this if you have questions, if you're interested. The other thing I can say is the alternative is, and it's a little a little more cumbersome, but it does work. And that's getting a bridge camera or a super zoom. Uh, I have a Nikon Coolpix P1000. It has a 3000 millimeter equivalent zoom built into it. And that is not op or that is not digital. That is an optical zoom. So the camera has failing points in other places. They have sacrificed certain qualities uh, to make the camera be able to do what it does. And the fact of the matter is, is like hand holding a scope. So getting a monopod for it might be a great idea, but there are several manufacturers. Canon has one, uh, uh, Panasonic. There, there's several manufacturers that have these bridge super zoom cameras and they change the game for a lot of birds and especially for shorebirds. I do handheld zoom shots with my camera. In fact, I don't know how much it'll show up. I, I have it right next to me. This is a, a five pound camera. This is a fixed lens. You don't have to buy more lenses, but 3000 millimeters of zoom in my hand on my shoulder at all times. And I take it literally everywhere I go uh, to help me get you know, the kind of shot from a bird that you can read a license plate from a half mile away, which means you can identify a bird uh, from a you know, hundred yards or whatever away uh, on it. I'm not gonna go too much into this stuff. I do wanna mention this here, allaboutbirds.org and media.eber.org. So I'm gonna jump over to that right now because this is important. This is how you like educate yourself. So like you can get field guides, buy the book, take a book home and read it and go through it. But quite honestly, if you spend some time on all about birds and just do a search and get into a bird. So I've got one up here, black bellied plover. It doesn't get any better than this to get a really good quality photograph that they have curated specifically and the alternate plumages. So a non-breeding adult here and be like, oh God, this is going to be tough. And it is going to be a challenge. But they also have really good descriptive info and cool facts about the bird. And the cool facts I found are really useful uh, in information uh, items, as well as, you know, some of their more, you know, common, you know, locations and stuff. Just another supplemental good website. The other one that I don't want to spend a boatload of time on, but I do want to use uh, is this one here. If you go, and, and I'll actually go the long route to get here. So this is eBird's website. And if you go into explore, search photos and sounds, that's all you have to end up doing is going to search photos and sounds. And the links for this stuff are, are in the chat. You'll get a very generic look like this and it's got everything in it. When I'm thinking about shorebirds though, punch in Minnesota. Don't look across the entire planet. Don't look across the entire country. There are regional variations in plumage on some of these birds. Punch in Minnesota to start. So you've got that filtered and then do a date filter. We're in the spring, so let's go uh, March to May and the last 10 years and set that. So we're just setting up filters. You can see them show up right up here. You can even do it based on contributors. So you could like say, oh, I just wanna see what Ben's got for pictures and shorebirds, it's usually bad ones. And then you just put the bird in. 
So you can type in any of those shorebirds, hit black bellied plover, and you can get real world photographs that other people like you took and uploaded to their eBird account and get an idea of what they look like. Trey Weaver's got some amazing ones in here. He's actually our field trip coordinator for MOU. And then you can get a look at their pictures and be like, oh, all right, that's what that bird looks like in breeding plumage. In real world scenario, you can see the mud around him and some open water behind it. And this is at... Uh, and it looks like he was in, uh, he was looking for red knots. So he was up in Marshall County. So that's up in the Northwest, but you can see a really great example of birds and continue to go through them and see what these intermediate plumage states look like. I highly recommend using this resource a lot uh, to get to know these. Realizing sometimes people make mistakes and they don't get caught, but for the most part, you're gonna find really good information out here that shows you the birds, uh, how you're going to see them. All right. So obviously I'm, I'm moving through pretty quick. We're uh, running low on time and there's still a lot to cover. It's the nature of the beast with this because there's just so much content here. I'm not gonna spend much time here because we did some stuff up front and I already talked a little bit about this, but if you get to know sizing uh, kind of keystone birds, it can really help you uh, to sort through a flock of birds. So Lee Sandpiper, six inches, that's a song sparrow. Okay, now you've got a, an entry point. In the mid tier of these birds, if you know what a killdeer is and say, look, I can ID a killdeer, then get to know its size. It's 10 and a half inches. That is an American robin. So think about robins in your yard, wherever you see them, that's what a killdeer is. And then compare all the birds around it to that. So if you don't know what the pectoral sandpiper is, if you've got a killdeer near your, nearby or a least sandpiper nearby and you do know what they are, you can start to get an idea and say, okay, well, that bird is bigger than this. It's smaller than this. And you start to get some sizing, you know, ideas on them. So pay attention to size. It's important. Everything about their body is important. So I just put some stuff in. The silhouette, how they look is important. Their relative size, we just talked about that. The length of the bill and the shape of the bill. Uh, is it longer than their head, shorter than their head? Is it insanely long? Is it decurved? Is it slightly upturned? Uh, you know, how, how is that stuff, you know, shaping in their neck length? Is it a really long neck? Is it a short neck? Does it look like it doesn't even have a neck uh, on it? Uh, legs, the length and color uh, can be very important, but this is one of these critical, be wary. Every one of these birds likes to walk around in mud. And the first thing that happens to yellow legs when you coat them in mud is they look black basically, or dark or brown, or they don't look like anything at all. So you can't make an ID on most of these birds with just one characteristic. You have to pay attention to several of them and consider the possibility that something about the bird is off because of its environment and its conditions. Uh, there are cases where if you are close enough to a bird or you have the optics for it, the wing length being longer than the tail uh, becomes important. We'll see that in a few minutes uh, on some actual photographs. Uh, and plumage becomes, and, and seasonal, uh, the honest truth is, you have to get to know to each one of these species in a season. So you've got spring birds, but the early part of spring, they're still moving into breeding plumage. So you get some weird overlap from the previous year's birds that are in winter plumage. And then you've got, you know, full adult plumage. And then you've got returning adults that are worn plumage that are starting to molt out of that plumage. And then they're followed by juveniles, which are in juvenile plumage, which is much fresher, but it's not the actual, you know, full uh, or whatever. Let me go here. Let's see, feeding methods. So actions matter, especially for these birds. If the bird is feeds in a very upright and like it runs from one spot to another and then stops and pauses and looks around and then runs again, it's probably a plover. Uh, if it's got a really long bill and it's just probing in the mud repeatedly like a sewing machine, that gives you a clue. That's like, oh, that could be one of the dowagers. It could be a Wilson snipe. You know, birds with those really long bills love to probe and just repeatedly kind of do the, the, the sewing machine type thing. Just looking through my slide here and checking the uh, notes. I see Michelle's got a note in there for individuals uh, to look at. 
Uh, some birds are surf runners. They will run with wave action, say up on uh, Park Point in Duluth, and and that's like a Sanderling uh, and Dunlin will do that. They'll run, you know, they'll follow the surf out and then they'll come, you know, back with it like they're trying to stay out of the water, like they don't want to get cold feet or anything like that. So paying attention to habits becomes very important, like where the bird is feeding. If it's feeding just on straight up mud, no like water slick or anything, it's just mud versus a bird that's literally walking in two or three inch water, seven inches of water, whatever it might be, those are different birds feeding in different food zones, different habitat zones in these little micro habitats from deep water all the way down to shore and into dry territory. Uh, all of that stuff matters and you kind of build that stuff together to get an idea of who the bird is. Um, so super quick here, in 2022, uh, I picked up 34 species of shorebirds. How did I pick up 34 species of shorebirds? I went to Lake Billsby 11 times. And I got 18 of my 34 species at Lake Billsby alone, but I had to go 11 times to get those spe that, that many species of birds. So I had to drive the 45 minutes down, scope at three or four different locations like we talked about earlier, and then you know return to that spot a couple of days later, a few days later, a week later, and just keep coming back and repeat, you know, rinse and repeat, uh, and then go to other locations and stuff. And it took until the end of May before I got 33 species of shorebirds. You can do it by the end of May. You just have to be crazy dedicated for it. Otherwise, just add a few at a time. You know, go to these locations, enjoy them a bit, uh, and then say like, okay, well, maybe in the fall, I'll do a little bit more. You know, biting it all off at once, uh, it can be a bit daunting. Um, let's see, we're gonna rule in, rule out. I'm just gonna move into uh, some of this stuff here. So getting to know those keystone birds. So like a kill deer, I consider relatively easy. And it's relatively easy because you look at the bird, you see two rings on the breast and a red eye ring, or just the two rings on the breast is enough and say, okay, kill deer. All right, so if you're talking 37 to 40 species, that's one down. You already know one, you're good to go. Uh, I took this picture up in Duluth. You can see the surf behind it. And here's a Dunlin and uh, breeding plumage, Dunlin breeding plumage, uh, ruddy turnstone. Ruddy turnstones just like stick out like a sore thumb, at least they do in my opinion with this really, you know, these big uh, dark blobs that come off them and this really nicely patterned face and, you know, these red, you know, kind of scapulars and stuff on the wings. And then you get this Dunlin, when they get into full breeding plumage, they got this huge black belly patch on them for a mid-sized shorebird with a decurved bill. Nothing else looks like them. So you get a couple more, you know, off it. And that's really, you just start kind of whittling away some of these birds. This is probably the, the oddest habitat location for a Wilson snipe. This is up at Big Bog SRA, uh, Northwest part of the state, uh, just about to enter into the location and you happen to walk across the road and I got pictures. But what I want to show is these con conspicuous streaks, even in terrible lighting, when you see a long billed bird hunched over probing into the mud, these streaks give away Wilson snipe in a heartbeat. Nobody else has these really cool kind of thick golden streaks on their back the way that a Wilson snipe does. And spotted sandpiper is kind of the, you know, same kind of game. Nobody else has this nice white underbelly and under parts all the way to the vent and just black spots all over it, like a wood thrush, right? Like it, this is like the shorebird version of a wood thrush. So with that plus an orange bill and this nice eyeline stripe, Nobody else approximates it. Like this is unique for breeding plumage uh, for them. So that like becomes part of the game. You know, we see these again. And that's what I encourage people to do is to look at the ones where you say, I know that bird. Like I'll know it if I see it in the field, like a uh, black neck stilt. Nobody else has giant pink legs or long pink legs over this delicate body with black and white. Lock it in, ready to go. And then save the hard work. Uh, for the ones that have to be compared sometimes, like the Godwits are a bit challenging. The Dowichers uh, are really challenging. So if we pop past these, uh, and I've got them in here, some of these greater and lesser yellow legs, short and long-billed Dowicher, least and semi-palmated sandpiper, and then this little complex of the pectorals, bairds, and white rump sandpipers. So we'll try and hit these, you know, relatively quickly. These are on the slide deck. You can look at all the, the stuff. They're in the links uh, and get in there. 
but all the field guides talk about this stuff and it's just get to know these things. What's a decurved bill look like? You can see just a slight downturn in that bill and it's got yellow legs. If it's in the mud, you're not gonna get the yellow legs, but it's the smallest one out there. It's a really good picture from Demels and Josh Larson they put up on their eBird accounts uh, in there. And then the, the, the lookalike bird, semi-palmated sandpiper. This is my picture from a sewage pond, I think up in Crow Wing County. And I, I pulled this out here just because it's humorous to me. This is what semi-palmate means, partially webbed. I wanna be honest with you, you're just not gonna see it. <laughs> This is one time in 11 years I've seen a semi-palmate on a semi-palmated sandpiper because they're always walking in mud. So unless you get them in a sewage pond on the rock, when are you going to see a semi-palmate and when are you going to get close enough? I was in a Toyota RAV4 with a 3000 millimeter zoom and this bird was 15 feet away. That's how I got the picture. But what I want to show you is these two birds overlapped. Uh, another amazing picture from Demels and Josh Larson here on their eBird account. And I've done some pullouts specifically from uh, our uh, Sibley uh, guide. You can see the difference, yellow legs and black legs. But Sibley even talks about it, rather dark brown overall versus gray brown overall. In practice, that doesn't sound like it makes much of a difference. But if you see the birds next to each other, this is the kind of nuance you end up having to look at. This is a very gray looking bird right here on these scapulars. And this bird is less gray looking. It's got these dark centers, a little bit of brown sprinkled around the edges, and this is in May. So these two birds standing next to each other, yeah, you can see the legs here, but if the legs aren't visible, and you don't get a very good look at the bill, you can still tell by the tone of the colors on them, uh, the difference of them. But this is the kind, of, the, the kind of stuff that you get over time. As you spend more time, I literally remember sitting beside my car uh, down at Lake Billsby with a field guide next to me, staring at these birds through a scope for 20 minutes to try and figure them out for the first time. And the, I do recommend spend field time looking at a field guide and looking at your birds. All right, we are at eight, but I'm gonna blow through a couple of these quick and then I'll, I'll call it. So I'll give myself like two or three extra minutes here and then Jen can tackle me at that point. We're all good on my end and uh, we are recording this. So if anybody does okay. have to cut out to, to take care of other business, we are recording. So thanks Jen, for staying okay. extra time. Yeah, yeah. So like this lesser yellow legs here, and, and this one is a lesser versus a greater. The, the great mnemonic that is often listed out there is bill length to head ratio. So all I did was I drew that on this picture. Uh, and then these three elements, I just copied and pasted them literally from the tip of the bill to the base. Oops, let me uh, back that up. Uh, from the tip of the bill to the base of the bill is the same distance as from there to the back of the head. If you can see that in the field, and trust me, you can see it, you can get used to it. It's not easy at first, but you get used to it over time. If you see this with a slightly just more of a, 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 a thin pointed bill, it's a lesser yellow legs. Take the same thing on a greater yellow legs, draw that distance from the tip of the bill to the base, duplicate it, and there's extra space back here. So this extra space, this is an indication that the bill is longer than the head by like a quarter or thereabouts. And that's what people are talking about when they're saying that greater yellow legs have a, a bill that's longer than their head. Uh, and it is visible in the field. And this is a much more stout bill uh, and longer. So if we just buy back up, you can see this is a, a much thinner bill and comes to a point much quicker. And then this is a more stout bill. If you take these two birds side by side, this is a picture of mine from Lake Elmo uh, Park. Uh, obviously this one didn't cooperate and put his bill out, but you can see other things that the field guides tell you about. And they talk about there being thicker legs on a greater yellow legs. And you can see in this picture, these legs are much thicker than these legs here and they're longer and taller. And you can just see this bird is an order of magnitude above this uh, lesser yellow legs. Getting them side by side is like the greatest boon you can possibly get. But if you get used to these thin little needle bill, same length as the head, there's extra coarse barring that goes into the underbelly versus it stopping short on this bird. All that stuff, you just have to get used to and kind of like, you know, add a little bit to your, you know, uh, identification skill set over time. 
Uh, pectoral sandpiper can give people fits as well, but as long as you remember they have yellow legs and they have the strongest demarcation of uh, stripes or barring or whatever on the breast to the rest of the body of any of the shorebirds. Like it literally just looks like somebody drew a line across the middle of their breast and said, okay, everything stops here. And that's why, you know, pectoral, it's the, in the pectorals or whatever, that's what's effectively giving you that identification of this kind of mid, mid-size shorebird. And then just a couple more of these slides and I can uh, wrap this up. White rump sandpiper is a really hard one to identify. It does take some time. But one of the things that you can do is it's one of two shorebirds where its wings are longer than its tail. So if you can get close enough, and this is really hard to see on this picture, uh, we'll see a better one of a Baird sandpiper. It's the other bird where this is the case. Long distance migrants and super long distance migrants uh, will have longer wings than their tail. And that's the case for white rumped and it's the case for uh, uh, the Baird sandpiper. Additionally, all the way down the flanks, just underneath the wing, uh, is this really fine streaking and spotting on this white rumped sandpiper. It does have a white rumped, kind of like a semi palmated sandpiper. I personally haven't seen it very often because you got to be staring at a bird for like 20 minutes straight to even get it a chance for it to fly. And if your scope is zoomed in so tight, you can just fly out of your view and you miss it. So the, the truth of the matter is, I see this characteristic here with this streaking and the uh, tail and wing length uh, on it. This is probably a better depiction of it. This was actually out at Salt Lake uh, like three years ago, picture of mine. Baird's is the most anonymous sandpiper in my opinion. Uh, like every time I look at one, I can't tell if it's a Baird's or not. Black legs is helpful. Being a generic looking bird is helpful. And then if I've got the camera for it or I've got the view of it, these are the wing tips. So these are just wings tucked in and they kind of fold over each other. And this is the tail. These wing tips are beyond the tail and you can see that in the field. And now of course, distance is a factor. It can be an issue, but when this bird is feeding, those two separate and you can see that uh, on them. And it, it's basically a lock for birds because there's also no flank streaking here. So remember, separate these two birds, there's flank streaking right down these sides and it might just be a little bit, uh, but on a birds, it's clean. There'll be nothing there. It's gonna be a white underbelly, generic bird, black legs, and then these long wings with short tail. Uh, uh, <laughs> Dowagers give me more fits than anything. If, if you think I'm an absolute expert on everything, I'm just gonna tell you right up, straight up right now. I, I prefer to have a friend with me when I have Dowagers in play because uh, they just give me fits. I have a hard time with them. I did a zoom in here on this particular bird because we see in field guides them talk about dark centers uh, and then tips and edges uh, that are barred and you get this kind of golden color around them. If I go to the next bird, you can see the subtle difference between these dark centers. And then there's these little rufous bars in there and white tips. On a fresh plumaged adult bird, these white tips help you lock in a long billed dowager, but so does the bill, so does the underbelly. And the comparison between these two birds you have to understand the little pieces, the little elements, try and get pictures if you can and work through those. It is, it is one of the great challenges of shorebirding is to understand what time of year it is, what's the date. Okay, it's earlier on the early side. So maybe it's more of a long billed dowager and then work through five or six characteristics in one shot and then make your identification and be willing to be wrong and ask people for help. Because uh, honestly, I do. Uh, I don't get them right all the time. Um, uh, we don't need to go through this or this because we talked about it earlier. And then there is some contact information. So hopefully I didn't bore anyone to death with uh, all of this. Giving me an hour is a dangerous thing. Um, uh, so Katie indicates I uh, can't see any of the links. All the links are here in the chat where you went. So I am going to add them again. They're right below your message. Uh, or I direct messaged you back. So they're uh, right in there. All the links are right there and I will drop them right back in here again for everybody just so that they're on screen. Uh, so those are all the links. 
Like I said, the entire slide deck is available out on my Google Drive to this link here. And then we will have this video up on YouTube. I will actually put it up on YouTube uh, some point in the next week or two. I do have that keynote. So give me a little bit of time, but we'll get it up and we'll get a notification out for it.